Following the collapse of the Silver Bridge over the Ohio River in 1967, the Department of Transportation required the state highway agencies to develop uniform national bridge inspection standards. Each state was required to establish and maintain a current inventory of all bridges on the federal aid highway system, including an inventory of historic bridges. Over the next 20 years, several programs were added to the initial legislation. The Special Bridge Replacement Program and the Surface Transportation Assistance Act, along with periodic modifications, greatly expanded state highway agencies' bridge responsibilities and increased funding to deal with the requirements. Today, among the many challenges facing state departments of transportation is the maintenance of historically significant bridges. These structures often chronicle the technology and culture of our past, which gives them a lasting place in the hearts of those who wish to preserve them. This is not always feasible due to cost, size, stability, and safety. What we realized was that the likelihood of preserving any given structure is really pretty slim because one reason a bridge gets to be historic is because it's old and with an old bridge you have to recognize sooner or later that eventually every one of these structures is going to be scheduled either for rehabilitation or repair or outright replacement. Faced with an aging bridge that demands extensive renovations a highway agency must assess the three currently available options. These are to preserve the bridge in place, either in vehicular use or pedestrian use, move it to a new location and maintain it, or thoroughly document the bridge and demolish it. The White River Bridge at Duvall's Bluff provided just such a dilemma for the Arkansas Highway and Transportation Department. This bridge was unique from both historic and engineering perspectives and was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. It was the only lift span Pratt through truss bridge in the state. Phone calls made to the surrounding states of Missouri, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Texas produced only one other specimen, which was located in Texas. The obvious first choice was to preserve the bridge in place and to build a new bridge upstream between it and the old railroad bridge. This was not possible due to U.S. Coast Guard regulations governing navigable inland waterways. An in-depth investigation revealed that the river had moved in the decades since the bridge was built, placing piers in the main channel. This constituted a severe hazard to barge traffic on the river. A search was implemented for another agency or entity to assume ownership. Queries were made to the Department of the Interior, Federal Fish and Wildlife Service to move the bridge to the White River National Wildlife Refuge and to the U.S. Corps of Engineers for possible relocation of the bridge in the districts of Little Rock, Memphis, or Vicksburg. There were no takers. The next best solution was to find a new home for the bridge, with the Highway Department retaining ownership. Several options were examined move the three main spans onto the existing East Bridge approach. Relocate the spans by barge to be used for recreation purposes or pedestrian traffic. Relocate the spans on land by transporting them by railroad car to a position nearby but away from the riverbank. The calculated cost for accomplishing any one of these alternatives was between one and two million dollars. With so many demands on the budget, this was not viewed as a prudent use of state highway funds. This left only one other option, and that was to document and demolish the bridge. In 1988, this bridge, along with all other National Register bridges in Arkansas, was documented by the Historic American Building Survey Historic American Engineering Record Division of the U.S. Department of the Interior National Park Service. Since this is the highest level and most meticulous documentation that can be done, it is accepted as an adequate mitigation to the adverse effects of demolition in most cases where actual preservation is not feasible. However, the Duvall's Bluff Bridge was distinctive and deserved special treatment. It was history we were capturing, really, not the, the engineering, because we already had the plans. You know, we knew what the engineering details were. You know, we were looking for something more uh, above and beyond just the the engineering, we were looking for the history.
documentation is accepted as adequate mitigation. And you realize that when <clears throat> you do this long enough and with enough bridges, all you're going to end up with is a bunch of plan stacks of plans. And you don't have the real thing or anything like it. A committee was formed to plan and oversee an enhancement project that would better document the many attributes of the bridge. Members, chosen for their expertise, were drawn from the highway department's environmental, engineering, and communication units. After much discussion and brainstorming, it was decided that the enhancement would consist of an informational video recording the history of the bridge, a scale model of the bridge, and an audio photo plate exhibit to be erected at the adjacent park. We decided that since the documentary video would, would be the big probably the big money item of the, the, the group of ideas that we would try to contract with a video production company as primary contractor and then let them subcontract the model and uh, the audio uh, uh, photograph display. Eight companies submitted proposals in response to the bid. Arcom Productions, a video production company located in Little Rock, was chosen as the provider to work in tandem with the committee. Our main role was not only to provide the video services, but to orchestrate the overall project. And that's what the highway department was really looking for. So once we had an approved script, and once we knew who the, the model maker was going to be, once we knew how these goals were going to be accomplished, then we pretty much stayed out of it and, and let, let them do their job. And I think the, the result of that uh, has been far superior to anything we could have done uh, in-house with, with the highway department. Well, obviously so. But the things that, that we never dreamed of were done by the production company because that's what they do. And the fact that, uh, in this case, the highway department, in their, I think in their wisdom, understood that and allowed us to, uh, to do what we do best, just allowing certain touch points, uh, keeping them apprised, keeping them posted, keeping them on a schedule, on a timeline, but giving us the latitude and not trying to micromanage this from their standpoint. Uh, helped this project stay on budget, stay on, uh, on, a, on the timeline that we had predicted, and give them the quality product that they desired initially. The first phase of the project involved building the scale model of the bridge. A local miniaturist with a background in engineering took on the challenge of building this exact replica. And I took uh, a trip down to Duval's Bluff to look at the bridge. I took probably 50, 60 pictures of the different shapes, looking at the underside, looking at all the different uh, piers from different directions, uh, from the uh, little gatehouse on the side of the, of the movable part, of the counterbalances on each side of that middle span. I got the myriads of, of as-built drawings out and looked at it exactly how it was built, uh, laid out the building at 1 to 20 scale, and uh, from there started to build. The uh, tools, of course, were micro-miniature type uh, tools. I used everything from uh, for drilling, especially setting all those steel pieces, the open web bar joist types and such. I used a number 87 drill. Uh, now that's about half again the size of a human hair, so it's kind of small. Uh, that's the kind of thing that's it's fun to use and to, to make it work and make it look right. We probably spent 150 hours total on the, the project itself, but it was, a, it was fun. A script writer was contracted to research and dramatize the history of the bridge on video. This process encompassed several meetings with the committee, general familiarization with lift bridges, visits to highway department archives, visits to the main library perusing back issues of newspapers, and numerous meetings with the townspeople of Duval's Bluff to enlist their help in the production of the video. My first thought was, how am I going to bring life to an inanimate object like a bridge? The committee had given me ample material on the construction and the functioning of the bridge, 
plus a history that a summer intern had written. But I still had a problem with making the piece live. A bridge is an extension of the people who use it. This bridge in particular was built by a man with vision uh, who listened to the folks in the area. He got the idea and he went ahead and built the bridge. And then through the years, the bridge became the people who crossed it, why they had to cross it, and how they did it, from mule carts to Model Ts to automobiles and all the way through. Okay. With this in mind, I set out to find people who were either around when the bridge was built or remembered uh, hearing stories about the bridge. I attended a town meeting where the highway department told the town that a new bridge was being built and wanted to get their input. And I asked everyone, have you uh, any experience with the bridge? Did your daddy work on the bridge? Did your grandfather, did your grandmother have any stories? And through that, I was able to locate some folks uh, who did have knowledge of that. And we set out a call uh, for photographs uh, and any information that people might have. And the information started to pour in. I think without the help of these people, this would have been a very dry piece. And I recommend to anyone who's going to do something like this to be sure and get the help of the local people. An exhibit specialist undertook the design and implementation of the photo plate display. Her 15 years of experience in exhibit interpretation, concept development, design, fabrication, and installation were crucial to the project. Photographs used in the video and part of the audio script were the basis from which the display was created. Today, a local park and camping area adjacent to the bridge has been enhanced with the addition of the new display. And nearby, construction has started on a new bridge. Really, it was just the only logical thing to do was to do the video on the hist history of the bridge and do the audio and build a building, you know, to show it to the future generations and people going through that may have heard of the old draw bridge across the high, uh, White River on Highway 70. And this way they can come down and you mash a little button up there and it tells you all about the history of the bridge. And then we have a video that, uh, you know, gives from when it first was built all the way up until now where we're seeing a new span go across the river and the old bridge will be removed. But we still have documentation that the uh, future generations can look back on and know what was originally here. As far as that bridge, if they'd have left it here, we'd have had a liability, which we couldn't afford. And if they dismantled it and took it down the river, why, it would just be an expense wherever they's going to put it. And we have come up with the better end of the stick. This project has received local acclaim and positive federal recognition. The enhancement project for the Duvall's Bluff Bridge is a dynamic solution to a sensitive problem. Bridges are a testimony of the will of humankind to link those things which are separate. For thousands of years, the universal need of providing easy access to facilitate man's endeavor has led to overcoming incredible obstacles with ingenuity and engineering. The White River Bridge at Duvall's Bluff is a perfect example of the creative resourcefulness that characterizes the American spirit. In 1821, the development of a road was authorized connecting the cities of Memphis, Tennessee and Fort Smith, Arkansas via Little Rock. When U.S. Highway 70 was mapped in the early 1900s, the road between Memphis and Little Rock closely followed the original route. It did not, however, provide for a means to drive or walk across the White River. River crossings were made by ferry. 
Although a scenic way to travel, it was often inconvenient. Space was limited. Long waiting lines were common, and ferry crossings ended at sundown. Bad weather and high water prohibited passage entirely. People and commerce relied on the railroad to provide uninterrupted service from one point to the next. Nationally, the railroad companies had undertaken the building of thousands of miles of bridges. The Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific Railroad Company completed its first White River Bridge in 1871. This was the only bridge in the area for 50 years, until Harry E. Beauvais paid a visit to Duval's Bluff. A town of significant historical importance, Duval's Bluff had long been the meeting point of river and overland traffic. While standing outside the Castleberry Hotel, Mr. Beauvais heard the rumblings of disgruntled folks about the urgent need for a bridge spanning the White River. A bridge that would allow the average citizen, by wagon, on foot, or in a motor car, to get to the other side without major delays. The seed was planted, and this entrepreneur from Stuttgart began to dream. It is a tribute to Mr. Beauvais that without funds or any foreknowledge of the enormity of his plan, he undertook the building of a toll bridge. The Territorial Legislature of Arkansas authorized the building and operation of toll bridges by private enterprise. All revenue went to the owner for a defined period of time. In 1906, the authority to bridge navigable water was removed from the states and vested in Congress. The White River, having more miles of deep water than any river in Arkansas, is highly navigable and permission to bridge its waters rested with the Federal Congress. Mr. Beauvais received his act of Congress to build the bridge in November of 1921 and from the county government his franchise to charge a toll. The engineering firm of Harrington, Howard and Ash of Kansas City, Missouri was contracted for the design work and the Missouri Valley Bridge and Iron Company for the construction. The bond money was raised and the magnificent steel and concrete vertical lift bridge began to materialize. The vertical lift bridge design is a variation of the medieval drawbridge. Construction began in January of 1924. I had a cousin, same age as me, about two months different in her age, and we was always looking for something to get into, just seven-year-old boys, you know. And we'd get off down there and, and the contractor run us off, run us back to the house to a young boy that it was amazing how they could go out there and pour concrete down in the middle of the river and here comes a pier up out of the river and they set a bridge on it. It was just, it just couldn't be done, you know, <laughs> when you're that age. Growing up, I knew that my grandpa Mathis was a master carpenter. But it wasn't until recently my mother told me uh, that my grandpa had almost lost his life while working on the bridge. Uh, where he was working at this particular time, the pilings had already been driven, and he was above that. He had a safety rope that was around his waist, and the other end was attached to the bridge. There was a man working with him that was to signal him and let him know when he needed to be careful and take a precaution something was fixing to happen. We don't know if the man gave the wrong signal or failed to signal. And Grandpa said that one minute he was working and the next minute he was swinging through the air and he swung with such force that when he landed on the ledge he hit so hard that he could feel the rivets in his back. On December 31, 1924, the bridge was completed for the total cost of $302,111. The new year of 1925 was ushered in with a day of celebration. All comers were invited to cross the bridge free of charge. My father ran the ferry, and he was much disturbed because of losing his job when the bridge was complete. People were awed by the spectacle of this impressive structure in action. The three Pratt trusses, built with riveted joints, instead of the old-fashioned pin-and-hole method, measures 606 feet in total length. The center lift span weighs 200 tons and operates on two 80-foot towers. It is suspended on these towers by 32-foot cables attached to two counterweights whose combined weight is equal to that of the span. 
the draw is operated by gasoline motor or by hand crank. A total rise of 50 feet gives a clearance of 55 feet above the high water. The total weight of the steel structure, including machinery, is over 1 million pounds. The tolls were set at 5 cents per person or head of livestock and $1 for six horse carriages or automobiles. Return trips made within 24 hours were sold at a reduced rate. The bridge had changed hands several times by 1930 when the state of Arkansas bought it for $1 plus the obligation to pay back the bond notes. The Arkansas Highway Commission assessed the condition of the bridge and decided that the original timber approaches, which were underwater during the 1927 flood, needed to be rebuilt in concrete and the wood decking replaced. The firm of Peterson and Earnhardt of Montgomery, Alabama won the bid for the job. Their request to use molded in place Raymond piles instead of the precast piles specified in the design was approved. Steel shells were driven into the ground by a steam hammer and once in place, the concrete was poured into the shell. Octagonal concrete columns were connected to the pile above ground. I, among others, were hired by uh, Mr. Bob Youngman, who was in charge of pouring the concrete. He was the foreman. And so uh, a long inclined ramp was built. And at the foot of this ramp was a huge mixer that mixed the concrete, you know, and, and it was dumped into wheelbarrows and it pushed up this incline and dumped into forms in which reinforcement steel had been placed. It was a very hard job. So I think we were getting about a dollar and 25 cents an hour. That was good wages then. You could get a sack of flour for 45 cents. The contract stated that the new construction could not interfere with the traffic flow or collection of tolls. This proved to be one of the greatest challenges for the construction company. July 10th, 1931. Dear Sir, a temporary approaches over your work are not being properly maintained. You admit this yourselves when you have all the passengers on the afternoon bus alight and walk over. We cannot have the state of Arkansas embarrassed by having the out-of-state passengers get out of the buses and walk over the unsafe bridge. Yours truly, E.P. Douglas, resident engineer. Despite the problems with the temporary structures and the high water conditions, the approaches were completed by the end of 1931. Like stoic sentinels standing shoulder to shoulder, they have sustained over 60 years of traffic with few repairs. Duvall's Bluff became a stopping off place for fuel and food. Small businesses sprang up on both sides of the river to meet the demand of the interstate travelers. The topic of conversation turned from how to cross the river to how to get rid of the high price of crossing the river, the toll. The collection of tolls throughout the state was a thorn in the side of its citizens. Many articles began to appear in the newspapers reflecting the general discontent. In 1940, after long heated arguments for and against the abolition of tolls, the toll bridges of Arkansas were open to free passage. Although the bridge no longer required a toll collector, the job of the bridge tender was still very much needed. At all hours of the day and night, the bridge had to lift its center span for river traffic to pass underneath. Several men have served in this position, climbing into the control house and riding up and down with the span. A Mr. Pate is the first recorded. Frank Kennedy held the job for over 20 years. She's old, he's quoted as saying in 1967. You've got to treat her like an old hen sitting on a nest. All the men have interesting stories to tell about the thrills and chills of bridge tending. One of the most harrowing experiences concerned the flooring. The deck of the bridge had been an ongoing maintenance problem. Because of the constant vibration of the spans, the nails in the wooden planks, then later the weldments of the steel planks, kept working loose, which caused the asphalt to crack. In 1960, a concrete flooring was installed to solve this problem. However, the weight of the center span was greater than the counterweights in the towers, and the span wouldn't hold in the lift position. The first time Mr. Kennedy took the span up, he reached the top and immediately started back down. By throwing the gear into forward, he was able to stop the descent. 
Unfortunately, all the cogs on the gear wheel were ground off in the process. When it was time to bring the span back down, he tried to put the gear in reverse, but the broken cogs wouldn't catch and the 200-ton center section dropped 50 feet. The bridge held, although an observer said that the metal section had bowed deeply when it landed, then popped back into place. It was reported that Mr. Kennedy had to rest a spell following this experience. Steel grid work replaced the concrete deck. This comparatively light material met the requirements of modern traffic but precluded any further use of mule and wagon. In 1972, after 43 years, the bridge was closed for major repairs to the original piers. In February 1972, the flow of the river was extremely high. And as usual, over a period of time, the flow would undermine the pier foundation the pier was founded on timber piling, and as it eroded, or no, was scoured out, or dug out underneath the pier, the water with sand in it tended to sandblast the, pile, the timber piling. The timber piling were approximately 14-inch gum pile cut from out here in the woods, driven in the ground, and then it, uh, and then that, uh, as they were sandblasted, they reduced in size to about six or eight inches, kind of an hourglass-shaped figure, and they gave way, permitting the pier to till. The bridge remained inoperative for 22 months. This was extremely detrimental to the surrounding area. Across the river, we had nice eating places. They'd closed down right away. Because, you know, people just didn't come over there. And the same thing happened to the people on this side. We had grocery stores, all kind of businesses here that just couldn't survive. That tells you what the bridge can do. But nobody wanted to put too much stock in coming back because it could do it again. For 14 years after the bridge was reopened, road and river traffic flowed through the seasons. Barges bearing soybeans, grain, and timber moved up and down without untoward incident. The safety and free movement of river traffic have always been the concern of the federal government. Since 1967, the jurisdiction of bridges over navigable waters comes under the Department of Transportation, and specifically, the United States Coast Guard. We have to make sure that bridges provide for the reasonable needs of navigation. And in so doing so, we make sure that the piers are properly placed, that uh, drawbridges operate properly, and that uh, bridges are properly marked for navigation at night. Overall, there's around 56 people in the Coast Guard that do bridges. In St. Louis, in uh, St. Louis, the second Coast Guard district, there's six people, and we oversee 21 states, 6,500 miles of river, and about 1,200 bridges. The crafts that navigate the White River have changed over the past 70 years. Years ago, and when the Duval's Bluff Bridge was first built, the navigation was a completely different type. You had more packet boats, you had single boats that carried all the commodities on the boat itself. Typical barges that operate on the White River and uh, pretty much operate on the other river systems in Arkansas are 35 feet wide, 195 feet long, and when they're loaded with uh, commodities, they weigh 1,500 tons. But uh, when you put all these barges together at 1,500 tons per barge, uh, moving downstream, it's quite a bunch of uh, weight and momentum uh, coming down that you know, could do a lot of damage to bridges if they hit them. Barges traveling downstream have difficulty maneuvering when the river is running high. As they make the curve and adjustment to safely pass under the railroad bridge, they must immediately adjust their angle to pass through the piers of the wagon bridge. Sometimes the swift current catches the barge in a sideways position and pushes it into the pier of the bridge. The bridge has sustained many minor hits, but the afternoon of January 7, 1988, is a special memory for Freddie Rogers and George Roberts. We looked down when we got the bridge up. We looked down the river and I told George that the barge was going to hit the bridge. I looked at him and I said, Freddie, there is no way that those barges are going to hit the bridge. Well, between the railroad bridge and the highway bridge, they really got out of control. And that's when they hit the, the pier. When it hit it, uh, the counterweight started swaying you know, backwards and forwards, then the bridge got to going 
you know, backwards and forward like it was going to fall in, so we was pretty scared. <laughs> but he said, well, my, my daddy always told me if I got stuck up here, I could climb down. I said, George, it's ice on the bridge. You can't climb down now. And he, he, he started down. So I grabbed him around the neck and his waist and pulled him back up. <laughs> I said, you're not going. He said, okay. <laughs> okay. A lot of times from the, from the top of the bridge, you have a real good view of the land. You know, you can almost, well, you can see the rice dryer and hazing. And um, I got a good view that day. A long view. Uh huh. I got to even, you know, we, we got to see the sunset. Right. <laughs> this 1924 marvel of technology has served with distinction. The Pratt truss spans and the lift mechanisms are considered pure American bridge forms, a treasure without a doubt that stands as a reminder of the pioneering spirit of this country. Unfortunately, it also stands on a very busy river and highway. The 18-wheelers of today far exceed the size and weight of the wagons and automobiles of yesteryear. Even the barges have grown in dimension. The bridge is dwarfed by the traffic it serves, and the safety of the people who use the bridge is now of great concern. As the ferry that once carried passengers, livestock, and vehicles bowed to progress, so this bridge bows to the need for a larger, safer, more accessible structure. Its history is preserved in a visitor center on the east side of the White River, marking the original site. It's bridged friendships. It's bridged gaps. It meant uh, a livelihood. It meant an opportunity for me to get an education because I had to cross that bridge to get to the school. So it, it just meant a whole lot to me. I really cannot imagine this town before we had this bridge. Thank you. 